Let's talk about digital health inequalities. Welcome EGP learners. There's a lot of talk about moving services to a digital first approach. There is also a lot of talk about health inequalities and addressing variation in outcomes in our populations. Many worry that as we drive more patients to a digital front door, that some patients will be excluded and their outcomes will worsen as a consequence. So today we're gonna to pick apart all of that as we explore digital health inequalities. Let's tech enhance your primary care and learning. So welcome, Gandhi. How are you over there in the other side of Nottingham? Ticking on all right, Andy. How are you? Yeah, pretty good. So very um, interested to be talking about this topic mm -hmm. today. I know um, it's sort of a debate that you and I are involved in from time to time locally, um, mm -hmm. being asked often about digital issues and also being involved in um, primary care networks and practices in areas of high uh, sort of deprivation, uh, for example, so areas affected by health inequalities. So topic quite close to certainly my heart and, and yours, I think, as well. Definitely. And I think one of the key things we're looking at today in this episode is the whole concept of, um, I, I guess, digital inclusion, digital health inequalities, all those kind of things that have an impact on what we do within general practice, within healthcare, but also, I guess, in society as well. Uh, and maybe that's a good place to start then. Shall we talk yeah. about what defining digital health inequality is? Yeah, what do we mean? So I think it's important to just um, define a few terms in terms of what we're talking because actually digital health inequality um it's something people have started to to talk about but that phrase itself i think is um uh, a, a portmanteau of um, a few different things you know it's it's things being uh, brought together to create a new concept so i think when we're talking about digital health inequality we're talking about um this principle about digital exclusion and digital inclusion uh, so digital exclusion is this principle that people don't have equal access to digital products and services and that this affects the sorts of outcomes and prospects that they can expect in terms of health but also in terms of other aspects of their life and digital inclusion is the inverse um, of this the process of trying to address digital exclusion um, mm -hmm. another important part of this is that health inequality part which i think is really spoken to by the inverse care law um friend of friend of the podcast we've talked about this quite a lot before but that's this idea that uh, or the principle that the availability of good medical care or social care tends to vary inversely with the need of the population served um so in areas where there is high levels of disease you know often that's the area that that actually gets the the, the less health care you know and there's a real strong relationship to um to health inequalities uh with this and i guess the final bit of the thread that i'm just going to weave in here is um there's a population health concept you know something that we've been working with in primary care networks increasingly over the past few years just flash up flash up a quick uh graphic here but this is the idea that actually in terms of people's health outcomes mm -hmm. there are lots of things that factor into that including lots of uh non uh not things that you might think of as non non-medical so these are the wider determinants of people's health so actually people's access to good quality care is said to represent about 20 percent of their overall health outcome so this is things like their life expectancy, um, like their uh, life expectancy in the absence of uh, significant comorbidities or significant disease. And that varies a lot based on um, social and economic and other factors. So um, mm -hmm. things like health behaviors, diet, exercise, smoking, alcohol use, level of education, income, job, employment, um, their built environment you know what what is the place where they live like you know all of these things have an impact and i think it's important to mention those here because um actually those are things that digital inclusion and exclusion increasingly have a big um factor in you know people use their uh, their mobile devices and their digital skills to mm -hmm. access a better mobile phone tariff to access cheaper energy costs to find a better place to live so uh you know increasingly those other aspects of life are impacted by their access to digital services and uh, that has an impact on their overall health outcomes. So hopefully we've set the scene for um, talking about digital health inequalities. So it's really about how digital um, issues um, and their digital um, access and inclusivity, inclusion, measure mm -hmm. of inclusion affects their health. People talk about it a lot. I know um, 
uh, we're involved in sort of discussions locally about um, about what we can you know what we yeah. can do about this i'm sure those discussions are happening elsewhere so uh, we both thought it'd be a good thing to talk about um you got anything to say about about the setup gandhi there so we've kind of set up the the terms um does that all sound sensible to you i think it does and i think recognizing the fact like you say that good clinical care actually when it comes to your health only represents a a relatively small portion of what keeps you healthy and i think that's an important thing to be aware of and obviously information in terms of other aspects so like you mentioned health behaviors information about education all those other kind of stuff plays a bigger part in in how what keeps you overall healthy um and i think focusing on how we can help improve some of that parts in terms of looking at you know, the challenge of digital exclusion, how we can include more people. And we're going to talk about some of the things that can hopefully help with that in this podcast. Um, but yeah, should we just crack on to, to the next parts of it and stuff? Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Let's let's keep some good momentum moving through this. So um, we're going to be referring to a few resources uh, as we go through this podcast. So one of them I'll just bring on screen um, now, uh, which is from the, uh, the Good Things Foundation. Um, you often see this, people often borrow it for slides. And if you're having to make a point about digital inclusivity, um, then uh, the Good Things Foundation is a good, good place to start. They do one of these infographics every year, actually, and it's really interesting to see how they've changed since they started doing them towards the end of the 2010s. Um, they provide some key statistics about digital inclusion and mm -hmm. a good infographic about you know how that impacts people's health. And it always includes access to healthcare, but uh, there's often things in it actually about um, you know, access to online banking, you know, access mm -hmm. to getting cheaper bills, access to finding a better job, you know, all of these things which are actually much, much more efficiently and sometimes only really available online. Um, and I like the way they have the sort of the, the green sort of digital inclusive land where people are doing things well. Um, they have the barriers. So they often talk about the barriers and these are different things each year um, in 2021, which I, th I think is the most up-to-date version I've found. They talk about affordability, skills and community support as barriers, but also bridges to help people mm -hmm. get there. Um, and then they provide some stats about, you know, excluded groups. So just picking some out. So four times more likely um, to um, have limited access uh, or usage of, um, of digital services if you're from a low-income household eight times more likely if you're over 65 1.5 times more likely if you're from a um a bame group for example so really really useful infographic and mm -hmm. i think really good at conveying that kind of impact that digital has on on all of people's lives um, and how all of that can impact their health so that's really really useful um just just for interest um the other things that we'll be talking about is a, a king's fund uh, publication um about digital yeah. healthcare and digital inclusion and exclusion and we'll be looking at um some ofcom the um the communications uh market regulator looking at uh, they're obliged i believe every year to provide a report to the government and the public about digital inclusion and exclusion and they have some really interesting uh data um, on that. So we'll just introduce people to that so you can use that in your local, you know, examination and discussions around digital exclusion. Um, so I guess we'll, we'll keep cracking on Gandhi, yep. if, uh, if that's okay. Um, shall we look at the Ofcom report? Let's bring that up. So it's, uh, it's not a hugely long report. I think there's about 20 or so pages, but for today, I think we'll scroll through and look at the infographics. And actually, it's a really good report for pulling some infographics from if you if you need to communicate some of these issues to colleagues in, uh, you know, in presentations, for example. So I'd be interested just to just to react really, as we go through. So this report is from March 2022. So it's fairly recent. And I def definitely mm -hmm. I think when we're talking about digital issues, it's important to use post pandemic publications because i think things really really changed at a rapid rate during the pandemic mm -hmm. um so we just got here they talk about their methodology um uh, and where they draw information from in their um uh partner organizations actually just interesting to the they um define how they define digital exclusion because this is a widely accepted definition of digital exclusion um uh, and it comprises three factors so access so sometimes people or struggle to access devices or data at home or mm -hmm. elsewhere. Sometimes people like the ability. So this talks to that skills and training element. You may have the device, you might have the um, unlimited 
uh, broadband plan on your broadband or your your um, 5G phone, but can you use it? And then there's an affordability thing. So you might have the ability, you might be able to access it somewhat, but do you run out of data at a certain point every month, meaning that you can't do the things that you need to do online, for example, mm-hmm. or can you just not afford it despite maybe having the ability and the theoretical access? So I think that's just interesting to outline for uh, people. Um, let's cherry pick some of the the infographics which are interesting so this is this is quite interesting just breaking down um people who have a smartphone it's really interesting just to look through this um this report um mm-hmm. they tend to break it down by age and socioeconomic class um so interesting so this is people who only use the internet on a smartphone people only go online on the smartphone so yes it's more so young people but interestingly those in the lower socioeconomic categories. Um, this is the you know A B C D E. So if you're if you're an A, then you you know you're maybe a, a, an affluent professional, um, and if you're a D, then that puts you at the lower end of the income spectrum, um, and you're much more likely to just be using your phone if you're at the mm-hmm. lower end. Any thoughts about that? Does that tally with your experience with people, Gandhi? I think so because it, it speaks possibly to the ability to have multiple devices, doesn't it? So um, if you are accessing the internet for a variety of things, a desktop can be a really great device to do that because it gives you more accessibility to various things. But obviously, a desktop costs more money. And do you run a desktop and a mobile phone, or do you just prioritize on the one that stays with you, which is the mobile phone, which is possibly where uh, I'm suggesting here maybe where that's the reason is the, in terms of people having just the mobile device as, as the route for, to contact, you know, using the internet and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's cheaper than broadband as well, I think, you know, to have yeah. something with a really basic data plan, you know, and that's something that you can take and moves with you if you are moving house often or if you're, yeah. um, you know, if you're homeless or you're moving around hostels or different locations or you're sofa surfing, you know, at friends and family's houses, as many of our patients do, you can just take that mobile phone with you. It works everywhere. You only need electricity um, to run it. So so that, that really doesn't surprise me at all. Um, uh, and obviously, it, it's you only need the device it. itself as well as the, the interface, whereas obviously from a desktop or a laptop, you need potentially other things with it as well in terms of obviously you've got a desktop, you need a monitor, you need a keyboard, you need a mouse. If you've got a laptop, okay, a bit more contained, but still you may want uh, additional things. Um, iPads, you know, tablets and stuff are, are great, but they don't double up for calling in, in terms of things. So obviously a smartphone has the benefit of being an all-in-one. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, it, knowing this can just help shape that, that design of services, can't it? Because mm-hmm. I'm just thinking about the process of maybe referring yourself to a podiatrist, for example. And sometimes that involves something which is easy on a, lap, on, a, on a laptop or a desktop, but but difficult on a mobile phone, you know, downloading True. a form and filling a form in and emailing it. You know, we, that's pretty easy to do on a, on a desktop, provided you know how to do it. Um, mm-hmm. But it's just technically and practically much harder on a smartphone and really what you need is uh, a web form you know for example yeah. um so it's important that people just just are cognizant of these challenges that people are you know who have limited access and are partially or totally digitally excluded have and i think that's going to be a theme running uh through what we're talking about today um do not have internet access at home um, so these people, they might have access on a mobile device, but don't have it at home. And I guess mm-hmm. we're sort of seeing similar, but in some ways, the age is sort of an inverse of, of that, of what we saw before. So mm-hmm. younger people, they've got the mobile devices, um, but they're not necessarily having fixed broadband, for example. Um, and uh, so actually, I think I've read this the wrong way around. So it's number lower, lower is better on this one. Uh, okay. apology. Apologies, Gandhi, I'm misleading you. But uh, yeah, people 75 plus, I guess, no um, uh, surprise that they are less likely to have access into their home. Although it's only 26% of people that don't. It's a fair amount, mm-hmm. but that means 74% do. And similarly, uh, people who aren't working and people at lower socioeconomic end of the class, uh, you know, have difficulty uh, yeah. having access to internet at home. Um, I just think we cherry pick some of these slides and i would encourage people to go and have a look at the whole report um uh, this is an interesting infographic styles changed here so percentage of people who don't use or have access to the internet so these are people who whether it's an access issue or a you know a training issue but they don't access the internet at all it's still 40 percent of over 70s um which uh does that surprise you or not surprise you gandhi um 
I don't think it surprises me. I think it's po- hopefully a downward trend as more and more people become mm. accustomed to using the internet and that kind of thing. But also important to recognize that, you know, you, once you get to 70 plus, you know, elements of frailty kick in, you know, having family to do things for you, um, care home-based residents as well tend, may have less access because of available devices and you know, engagement in the care home, that kind of stuff. So, you know, there is always going to be a proportion where I think that number is higher for logistical reasons and it comes down to accessibility, possibly, um, but also then ability changes as well. If you are having challenges with memory, for example, dementia, those kind of things, you may feel less certain about going online because of the risks of going online then in those situations and therefore delegate that to other members of your family, friends, that kind of stuff. And therefore that may also have an impact. Again, just surmising here. Yeah. And it's in, and I don't know why, but the thing that just struck me was the digital exclusion is, is a bit invisible to us. Um, you know, I, I often see an older person, you know, using a device, for example, and that, so that's visible to me and, and you know, it's, I can see that they are included, mm-hmm. but, but you don't see when people are excluded and we don't ask. So actually yeah. it struck me that actually digital exclusion can be a bit invisible in a way, you know, and, mm-hmm. and actually it's become the default that we assume that people, uh, you know, can, you know, the majority of people can use digital um, devices or mm-hmm. the plurality of people but that's not necessarily you know the case and, and how do we know when people are digitally excluded it, there's some invisibility to it which just struck me um it's, it's interesting just to see that this is higher in people who have limitations or impairments so some level of of disability um people financially vulnerable and people living alone as well are higher than this 10 percent um average which is interesting and then broken down in a different way people who don't have access or use the internet so this is kind of combining some of those factors above so actually people who have people can have some sort of multiple patches that put them at higher risk of digital exclusion so if you're um over 70 and you have some sort of limiting condition then you're much more likely uh, to not uh, use or have access to the internet at home um so i think that's interesting um mm-hmm. And, and actually might help us identify those people a bit more who are at risk, just knowing that, you know, having a number of these factors stacked up can help identify those people at risk of digital inequality. Uh, so just people who don't have a connected device. So this is people who don't have any connected device at all, uh, regardless of whether they can use one or not. They just flat don't have one. So I think this is an, uh, an, an important um, yep. stat. 7% on average. Um, and then we're above average with limited conditions, uh, low socioeconomic class households, people who don't work, um, the over 65s, and uh, people who are earning under um, 11,500 as well. So that's probably part time um, workers. So, you know, 20% is quite a high n- number. And actually, any mm-hmm. internet connected device, you know, we often assume, oh, everyone's got a mobile phone, but actually, in certain categories, the number of people without even an internet connected mobile phone is still significant. Um, I think I'm going to skip Gandhi to the last. There's all sorts of very interesting stats, and the infographics are, uh, you know, if you yeah, look cool. aren't able to, yeah, if you're not able to read the whole thing, then look at the infographics and you know borrow them to make your own points. Um, this final table I think is useful as well because it just breaks down the challenges that people uh, face in getting access to digital services. Um, and then just provides a little bit of context about who and how are affected. So we're looking at connection, um, reliability, and speed, which we haven't really talked about before then. But you know, many of our GP practices might be in rural areas, for example, with mobile mm-hmm. phone black spots, um, areas that still do not get good quality broadband connection speeds. So those are all factors. Um, they talk about access to equipment and devices. Um, by being limited just a mobile phone or no devices at all, having outdated hardware that doesn't render web pages, you know, correctly, Mm -hmm. you might have a device, you might not keep it up to date, it might be riddled with viruses, Um, affordability, and access to contracts. Um, Something that that comes up within the report is this concept of social um, tariffs, uh, which we may get to later as well. But um, to develop this idea that actually a minimum level of usable um, data speed and connectivity and it ought to be available at a very you know at a, a very affordable cost and that actually there should be sort of policy movements in that direction i think that's a, a valuable concept digital skills um i think this is where actually a lot of 
digital inclusivity work has focused in the past, you know, particularly on this area. And then they also talk about other types of challenges. And I think an important one here, particularly given the makeup of our city in Nottingham, um, is the acknowledgement that people with um, low uh, English language proficiency can struggle to access digital services um, and can be digitally excluded, as well as people with just general low levels of, um, of literacy. So I think that that's important. Um, any reaction to that, Gandhi? No, I mean, it fits with things that we know, isn't it? I mean, like you mentioned about the whole concept of non-English speaking being a, a barrier. Interestingly, digital can also help in some ways because I've often mm -hmm. had patients whereby they, they've not been able to speak English but can use digital devices really effectively to help translate things to make their point more evident. Obviously, there's the issues of congruency and how well it, and, and the quality of that information, but they are assistive tools that can be used. And that varies in terms of the spectrum of how that works with different people and different patients. And you will have some that, you know, obviously speak virtually no English, but can fly in terms of those environments with assistive technologies, mm -hmm. but others that where they really struggle. And then, and like you say, that can impact their healthcare journey. Yeah, no, absolutely. And often we're, we're quite um, careful about using these sorts of assistive language technologies um, or instigating the use as clinicians, mm -hmm. but but actually, it, you know, it it's often feels very different if the patient is making the choice and they know their level of proficiency uh, and mm -hmm. experience of using those tools. And if they, you know, and it's all it's all about patient choice, really, isn't it? And and sometimes yeah. people, you know, just for speed, will choose to translate something on Google Translate for you because they use it a lot in their day to day life and they, you know, they trust it to give you information rather than mm -hmm. um, uh, them taking up the offer of a a, a telephone interpreter for example so i think that's mm -hmm. an interesting area and it's just made me think actually in this in this talk we're really talking about how how technology and digital inclusion affects patients there's a whole other debate about staff training and staff access yeah. to digital which i think we'll have elsewhere um so um so that's the offcom report really encourage people to to take a look really useful infographics for making points to colleagues um, and understanding the problem of digital exclusion now the next thing we're going to look at um, and uh, we will rapidly find that there's an interesting doctor from Nottingham who's done some interesting work in uh, in video who features in this report. But this is um, a report from the King's Fund, quite recent. So it's from March 2023. So this is really pretty up to date. Um, moving from exclusion to inclusion in digital healthcare. And I think the best way to go through this, Gandhi, is really just to focus on, on their headings and just frame a little bit of a discussion between the two of us. Uh, about mm -hmm. these things and people can you know join and and, and comment um below as well um about these things so um so they define you know digital um exclusion and actually what they say is digital exclusion refers to the lack of access skills and capabilities needed to engage with devices or digital services that help people participate in society so very similar to off mm -hmm. Uh, definition. And then they say in healthcare, additional factors that are not relevant to other online interactions can contribute to digital exclusion. For example, privacy uh, may be required. So they're just acknowledging that healthcare can be a little bit uh, different um, as well. Um, this report's really interesting to start to think about what you can do about digital um, exclusion. Um, so it's about why improve digital exclusion. I think we've probably made the case for that already really um mm -hmm. you know digital exclusion it excludes people and you know it, it worsens yeah. the outcomes for those that are that are excluded so it feels like a bit of a no-brainer but it is worth as we did at the beginning of this episode just really stating how much impact it has particularly as we move to a word where a world where the default is, it can be digital you know these days you know we need to make sure that we accommodate for those who are excluded and that we support people to be included and that we respect mm. people's choices you know sometimes people you know for good reason um may choose to access a service in a different way um so they talk about fixing the fundamentals um so providing devices they talk about a few places where this has been done uh, either giving devices to people um sometimes loaning devices out to people to improve their confidence um mm -hmm. and then they talk about this issue of actually do you restrict the capabilities of devices that you give to people so that they can only be used to access healthcare or do you just give them the device and let them use it for whatever they want to use it for um and do you have any Obviously, we've not been involved in, um, 
you know projects or studies that involve these sorts of interventions but what's your your kind of just instinct on providing devices from you know me to people day to day who might be affected by this issue gandhi i think it's, it's an interesting perspective because it's also that perspective you take it from the concept of patients or do you take that from the concept of staff because we talked about obviously the you know staff element of it so you know you and i are both aware that whenever we get a device from um for work using for work it's often restricted in terms of what we can put onto it you know how that can then work, work in terms of what we're meant to use it for now absolutely appropriately those devices are meant to be used for work purposes but because they are limited, that can then block some of the stuff you might want to do for work. Um, and does that change accessibility in terms of if you had another device? But when you're talking about patients as well, it's a similar principle. Now, I can understand why they sometimes are limited, because what you don't want to then happen is, you know, pay, pay people going onto particular sites or places, downloading viruses, unintended consequences of the places they may use those devices and the way they may use those devices. And then who's responsible for those unintended consequences as well becomes a liability issue, which is why the often the easiest way for some organizations to take that is, well, we just block everything apart from the stuff we want you to use the device for. That's where the compounding issue is, isn't it? Is it about effectiveness, usability, and congruency and making sure it keeps being usable and stuff so yeah i, I imagine this um it's quite an issue uh, i imagine this issue relates to whether you're kind of giving the whole device because then you're kind yeah. of you're giving them a device you know people can use it however they want you're not providing ongoing support and i would argue that you're not responsible then for how it's used you know if you True. give it and it's owned by them uh if you're loaning devices i think that's that's a different matter actually because yeah. you're probably paying for the data connection you know you've got some more responsibility in terms of whether that's used uh responsibly um so i think it's an interesting debate and i think you know, it'd be interesting just to see, you know, people will try different things around the country they already are and to see what the outcomes are. My gut instinct is actually, I think there's something about just, you know, giving people a device because I think people use devices in all sorts of unpredictable ways. Uh, some of them might be negative, but actually people use them in unpredictable, positive ways to improve their life um, mm -hmm. as well. You know, maybe they want to watch some self-improvement videos on YouTube. You know, you don't want to restrict that or another site or no. listen to podcasts. You know, maybe you would anticipate this and unlock those features but you know there might be unintended positive consequences and i don't think i would like to get in the way of of that um we see a lot of people with devices though don't we so i i i think for some groups who are digitally excluded access to a device is a problem but i think for a number of others it's not so i think there's something about being targeted with yeah. schemes about giving you know giving devices and making sure that that's what's needed to unlock and i think kind of a personalized approach um is is key really to finding out why someone is digitally excluded and to unlocking unlocking that um they talk about providing data so you've got a device it needs to connect um to uh something um and that's whether whether you actually you know pay for data you know for people yeah. who are digitally excluded um and uh data particularly if you're partnering with you know, data and connectivity providers um, and I think this is where this concept around social tariffs starts to come in. You know, I think actually that's an area that could provide quite a lot of, of benefit, um, I think. Um, so, um, yeah, it feels like people, I mean, people need the data. Have you got any thoughts about it? It feels quite simple, really. It feels like it's just a case of how you get it to people. And I guess for those data providers, they don't want to destroy their business model of selling data to other people. So no. I suppose your social tariffs are probably going to be limited in terms of speed. You know, maybe you can't watch 4K Netflix on it, um, mm -hmm. but you can order your repeat prescriptions or watch, a, yeah. a, you know, a health video in, in in normal HD on YouTube, for example. Any thoughts on data, Gandhi? Well, it's interesting because we already see some elements of that. So, for example, with my um, phone provider, if I do go over my limit, actually, they still allow me access to the internet through data, but it, it's like you say, it's capped. So what I can do with that data becomes a bit more limited. So I can't, for example, upload YouTube videos or, or do that kind of stuff, but I can still WhatsApp and I can still browse the internet, but I can't do anything that requires huge amounts of data like video processing, that kind of stuff. So, you know, that already exists. There are other providers who, who say that, you know, you have this amount to use for the internet, but actually you can use these applications for free because we back end that in another way and stuff. And potentially that the whole concept of social um, data provision, I think is a really positive step for particular groups. You know, 
the other option is giving access to um, Wi-Fi hotspots mm. um, in different places, because actually the majority of particularly inner city areas will be covered by, you know, hotspots that people can access almost wherever you are, even in the residential aspects and stuff because of the way that they work. It becomes more of a challenge in rural areas, I guess. Um, but then that's potentially where you look at some of the other options that we talked about. Yeah, yeah. It, it feels to me like this access to devices and access to data is an area that's sort of slowly being tackled, I guess, Agreed, you, yeah. know, as, you know, as, as devices with basic functionality become more and more um, affordable uh, mm -hmm. and commonplace. Um, an area that's a bit more tricky to deal with is the next area they talk about, which is building um, digital skills and the yeah. confidence to deploy those skills within people. Um, and it feels like that's actually a more difficult thing to achieve. Sure to be honest. Um, they talk about a number of approaches. So they talk about um, community assets. Um, and in this section, I think they're referring to to people, really, some digital champions, digital angels. You know, they talk tech angels. They talk about all sorts of different mm -hmm. uh, terms here. But I guess it's people, um, you know, from the voluntary sector or, or where, wherever they're sourced from. Um, or the, potentially the health sector. I mean, you know, yeah. or some networks may be looking at for obviously their digital transformation leads um, in terms of their, you know, responsible yeah. members of their team to look at how digital works from a healthcare provision. You may have digital inclusion coordinators. So, so we're digital, looking at digital that social prescribers. Yeah, yeah I've, digital I've heard social that prescribers. Term. Yeah. Um, your care navigators within your own practice teams potentially could be the people to help guide people how to use various aspects, like, for example, the NHS app, which is a really key option when it comes to digital journeys for patients because we know that more and more of the healthcare journey for patients is being directed through the NHS app and, and obviously supportive tech that kind of stuff you, you know my view that there should be a video to help you do everything um, and if you know particularly when it comes to health tech well I probably created it um, but you know it's available and stuff and, and the guide you know those type of guides can be really useful but you still also need somebody to show you how to do that in the first place if you don't even know how to access a, a video you know what's the point in it being there if you can't get to it kind of thing yeah you often hear, hear people talking about programs that attempt to cascade uh skills and learning mm -hmm. through populations as well you know encourage uh those people who participate in programs who are uh, helped to show their friends show other people become involved in those efforts to um, yeah. get other people uh digitally skilled up um so and um I think these programs are really, really good, actually. Yeah. Um, it's also something about encouraging you know, family, friends, you know, to help each other as well. You know, community drives to just show people how useful that sort of activity is, I think, is really, really um, laudable as well. Mm -hmm. um, and they talk about not just individuals, but obviously it's groups, you know, and services and teaching more than one person at once. You know, there's all sorts of approaches. So, yeah, community um, assets and efforts are really really useful talked about they talk about befriending services uh, particularly so i think that speaks to more of a uh, a one to one sort of approach or one to small mm -hmm. group um approach in terms of helping um and i guess sometimes people you know they're never going to they may never develop the skills to be proficient online, you know, and those people actually just need the support, you know, from people to access services or they need services to be accessible in another way. Now, there's a special um, mention about patient educational videos as an important tool. Um, and it appears to be, you know, one of the only parts where a specific clinician is mentioned as having done good work. They talk about a doctor from Nottingham called Dr. Hussain Gandhi, um, who uh, began during the COVID-19 pandemic to produce uh, informational videos for patients to be disseminated, uh, including how to register with your local GP and how to send a photo to your doctor. So, um, so that's good. So special mention for you, Gandhi. Do you, do you want to talk to this for a second uh, about the importance of patient education videos as a particular yes. thing? The King's Fund have highlighted patient education videos um, as a as a specific intervention that might be helpful. So just talk to that for a second. Sure. So I, I, mean, I guess I mentioned earlier about the whole concept that actually having a video guide of how to do something can be so much more powerful because it's literally somebody showing you how to do something. And that's the part that often we find really tricky because of time. Let's be honest, we don't we don't have the time often to do a lot of this stuff. And for those people who don't have that knowledge, the best way to help them get that knowledge is to show them and then get them to do it 
and more importantly actually the best way to learn knowledge is actually to teach it but you have to start on that journey towards doing that and and my view has always been that things like videos are a much better way of trying to do that rather than explaining it to people that kind of stuff and things so um you know it's one of the reasons why i created those videos I, i've often talked about the the how to take a photo of your throat video how for me that was just a, a you know something i created to help my patients in realizing that actually I could help many other people and actually it has done you know that it's been my, one of my most downloaded videos that I've ever created because people have that need of understanding how to take a better photo of the throat and that improves the quality that improves the journey for many people same with you know, registering for the NHS app it's a process having somebody walk you through that process is so much more effective than just here you go here's a device kind of thing and figure it out for yourself and things so um uh, like I said, I was involved in the creation of, of part of this document from the um, focus group perspective. And, you know, they, they picked up on that part being a key part of the journey for patients in terms of understanding what they need to do. And there's so many ways it can be applicable. You know, when it comes to navigating around the hospital, having a video to show you where you need to go to a particular department, because that can reduce the stress of an individual going to their healthcare journey. You know, if it's for a test, explain the processes. If it's about how to fill in a form, what are the key things you need to fill in when it comes to those parts? Because actually that can help with the information journey of that patient or, you know, other kind of details and stuff. So there's so many different ways that you can use video. The challenge with video is translation. I think from my perspective, you know, non-English speaking, you know, um, assistive technology, but actually that is improving so rapidly that hopefully, fingers crossed, there'll be less of a barrier to people in the near future. Yeah, and it'd be great if YouTube can do that on the fly. Their captioning is quite is quite is quite good yeah. already. Um and that can be translated you know so that's really good mm -hmm. um right oh good gosh you you definitely did have plenty to say about that but it is such a powerful tool actually it is, yeah. um you know it, it's so powerful and, you know and i'm going to use it just to springboard into um a, a health inequality point that that i wanted uh to make as well uh, it's about it's about text messages so um because we have to be careful i think when we're as systems deciding how to respond to certain challenges um, and how we um, change what we do. So uh, text messages are fairly expensive um, uh, to send. Um, and uh, there's a big drive, I think, in many places to reduce these text messages. In healthcare, text messages really came into their own during the pandemic. And it was a real yeah. big surprise, I think, to us and to the system how useful they were because it enables you to do something like send a hyperlink to their phone that they can click on and that click on and they can view a video about how to get their covid vaccine how to register with the nhs app how to take a photo of their throat it's just so versatile and so powerful and so universal uh, mm -hmm. you know it works on practically every phone everyone can receive a text message no one needs to install an additional app um to do it uh no one really needs to uh, you know click through to a different website to to view the text or things like that and mm -hmm. just a concern that i have is that there may be a decision made to move away from uh, the technology of text messages uh towards you know believing that this job can be done yeah. by um other apps that people can can in, in install on their phone perhaps even the nhs app itself that are more complicated to use and that we will inadvertently exclude a lot of people from a lot of benefit um because it is really easy to use uh, text messages and to click on links to videos. It's actually a lot harder to use and also trust other apps, you know, to have to be bothered enough to download them and put them on your phone. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of hassle. I just I just worry that we're going to move backwards. And actually the populations that will be affected by this, you know, won't be, you know, educated affluent populations who will probably install the apps, no. but it'll be people who have other things to worry about in life or digital excluded who won't say so it's just a bit of a uh uh on my uh campaign box um defending text messages they're not perfect you know they're open to, to spoofing and spamming and all sorts of things but actually they also do work and they also are universal and you know you can spoof and spam someone by putting a letter through their door but we still send people letters so i'm not Great. sure quite how strong those arguments are but anyway back to um the king's fund report yeah. Um, so they then they talk about um, structuring services um, around people's needs and preferences. And, and here I can see a lot of alignment with um, the recent contract changes, actually, um, which uh, we talked about at length, those imposed contract changes. But they defined what a contact with a practice is and they defined 
uh, and they uh, made it a contractual requirement to handle those equally uh, so that people got the same outcomes regardless of how they contacted the practices and they included digital methods of contact and telephone but also face to face so actually um gp systems at least cannot give preference to or only deal with people or say that people have to fill in an online yeah. form to to get an appointment at the general practice or to get an outcome from the general practice you know they can achieve that by ringing on the telephone and they can achieve the same thing by turning up um in person um and mm. that i think uh, is compatible with and speaks to this idea of actually tailoring things to people's needs and i think actually that's quite a powerful mechanism of guarding against um people's health outcomes being affected by digital exclusion so uh, it's just interesting to point out the consistency with the contract there so they talk about actually identifying people's preferences and what they're able to do and actually working around that so it's also aligns with this personalization of care um mm. agenda um uh, do you have any thoughts about that Gandhi? No, it feels just sensitive. to say that important to recognize the opposite is also true as well so just like the contract the contracts whilst it states that you can't you know you should not offer, offer only one route of access to to the system and to the healthcare and that kind of thing. So just like you mentioned that, you know, perhaps you should not be using digital as the only route in. Similarly, you can easily argue that they shouldn't be using face to face as the only route in to the mm. practice as well. So it does need to be a complement of offers to each individual person. So, for example, a person with significant social anxiety may find the experience of coming to the practice so overwhelming that they they can't access healthcare because of it. So then actually the digital routes are their mechanism way in. Mm. So, you know, they're just as valuable. And, and often those patients have created a situation that allows them to do that, um, you know, because they, they've they've had to develop that need. Um, mm. So important to recognize it's two sides of a coin as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think I think systems and GP practices, you know, they can uh, actually there's there's something in embracing this really because yeah. you know for a lot of people actually they will prefer you know the digital route it'll be more convenient to them they don't they can they can register their question and then they can go off to work you know and, and wait for an, a, an answer to come through when they don't even have to pick up the phone you know they can just check at a time convenient to them so a lot of people will love interacting in that way and that will keep the other channels face to face the front desk the telephones open to those people who need to communicate in those channels so you know i think um you know viewed in the right way there's the potential for this to be better yes if you've got enough everything. resource to do so but that's a Does separate it, topic yeah i mean it doesn't you've still got it's the same amount of work isn't it over yeah. overall so we just have to be uh, aware that digital doesn't um necessarily and actually more often than not doesn't actually reduce workloads you know it just allows different patterns of access increased accessibility but it doesn't affect workloads but we talk about that at length uh, elsewhere on this uh, channel mm -hmm. um, so i think that's so personalization um also it kind of moves away from this digital first um phrase that we used to hear a lot um mm -hmm. doesn't it it's sort of advocating a move away from that sort of thinking and more of a digital and you know um way of uh, delivering things um they talk about tiering the level of digitization so actually you know it, it shouldn't be a one or the other pathway and that actually we should be tailoring that experience to people's level of access and ability to use um digital tools which is interesting um and uh working with communities to develop more inclusive services so there's a lot of you know focus on engagement with, with services and i think this is great and it provides some examples of good practice in that space um they then talk about improving quality and consistency of services um so this is um it's interesting they talk about do you create a centralized group of expertise uh, i think that's always a good thing but you also mm -hmm. personally but i think you also need um people with varying levels of expertise closer to the closer to the patients and the populations to uh, to disseminate that um, really. But interesting, interesting report and a good way to frame a discussion, I think. Um, Definitely. So Gandhi, I guess that leads us to um, what can we uh, do about it, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, before we get there, I was just going to um, say something that's that's not within the report that I think we'll be talking about more in the future is about um, information quality and that, that that's an issue. And it, it's interesting that that hasn't made its way into this thinking yet. So 
we all know there's a lot of misinformation out there. Um, I think the quality of health and health related information and information in general, I guess, for that matter, that people consume or have access to or is presented to them by algorithms um, actually does have an impact on the choices they make uh, in terms of their lifestyle choices and their choices to uh, accept or decline or what type of medical care they access. Um, and that that has an impact on their, their health outcomes. So actually, I think in the future, we might be talking a lot more about quality of information as part of this issue. And it's just interesting that we're not talking about that yet. Um, Did any you thoughts come on up that? With a phrase for that, Andy. Ah, okay. So so you, you heard it here first. Well, actually, you, you heard it about a year ago, a talk I gave. Um, uh, I'm going to call this it, the information ohm. So uh, just like people have, uh, they have a genome and there might be parts of that that are beneficial to health or negative to health. And people have a biome or a gut biome might be beneficial, might be negative. You've got an epigenome. Um, there's all sorts of ohms that we have. And I think people have an information ohm. So that information that they have access to or that they have access to and that they carry around in their head influences their health behaviors. Um, and that influences their health outcomes. And so I'm calling it the information ohm. You, you heard it here first. Um, yeah, do you think that's a thing? Is it a real thing, Andy? The information name? It's a concept, I guess. It's a concept, definitely, and it's a concept I agree with. Um, I hope I don't know if you have created it or not, but it sounds like it because, like you said, we've not been able to find anybody else that's come up with something similar. Um, and if you have, let us know because yeah, we yeah. really don't the, con the concept out, the concepts out there, but the term information name that's new. It's sure. EGP learning first. But it's it's a really interesting concept, and I think it's one that absolutely we're going to probably lean into in the future and stuff. I guess you asked the question about the suggestions for primary care in terms of how to deal with this. And I think there are a couple of things I, I would definitely recommend primary care considers or looks at and stuff. So um, I guess with my hobby horse of videos and stuff, absolutely mm -hmm. using video technology in particularly because it's relatively easy to do um, and create or, or borrow, you know, Obviously, that's one of the things that EGP Learn does is create loads of information videos to help patients and practices understand how to use all the stuff that's out there and stuff. So feel free to use it. If it's on our YouTube channel, it's there for you to use and stuff and signpost patients to, whether that's about accessing information, whether that's about um, accessing technology and how to use them, whether it's about simple patient education videos and stuff. I think the quality of information needs to be looked at. And I know different places are looking at that in particular. So, the you know, what is good quality health based information? YouTube are doing loads of stuff on that. So are most of the other platforms. There's a patient information forum, which are really excellent group looking at the quality of the information, how to validate people when it comes to that, in a sense. And it's something called the PIF tick. So if you see creators with that, you know, at least you've got the reassurance that they've got more, um, you know, quality to the information they've created and stuff. I think in terms of accessibility, yeah, okay, people need access to the devices. But so then thinking about how can patients have that? We've given technology to patients, for example, in the past when it comes to simple things like blood pressure monitors actually is a really common one. You know, giving them the, the technology to self-care themselves because actually we know that I can work more effectively. Um, uh, peak, uh, sorry, SATS probes, another one for respiratory disease. But also, can, do people have their own tech to use? So, we, you know, years ago, Andy, we talked about wearables and, and their mm. use in healthcare and stuff. And we're seeing actually more and more wearables having better quality kits within them. The, the Apple Watch is considered near enough medical grade um, when it comes to certain aspects of stuff. So recognizing that they are factors to consider and think about in terms of the information that patients drive with. And how can you support patients having better access to that kind of stuff? Um, and then when we're talking about, you know, ability what resources do you have within your teams to support patients to develop that ability i know one of the journeys i always talk about with patients is we had a patient who had lots of real complexity when it came to um, accessing the practice um and would often call up an emergency and cause real challenges for us to deliver that health care and a lot of it was about visually based stuff so there's things like skin rashes that kind of stuff and and they just felt they didn't have the skills to send us a photo which would have actually made the process so much easier for us but especially for the patient, because it meant her having to leave family, you know, having to, uh, you know, she had multiple children, the, the aspects of caring for them as well, that became a constant problem. So actually, I, I just took it upon myself to help educate her and literally showed her on her device how to take a photo, how to send it to us. You know, it took 15 minutes of my time, 15 minutes of clinical time. Mm -hmm. But for that patient, that saved so much journey time in the future 
cost in terms of her coming to the practice financially in terms of transport, in terms of, you know, taking her children out of other things that she would have had to do because of her own health care, help to do that same process for her children as well. So the, 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 mm. the impact that would have had, from my perspective, at the very least, both for that patient's journey and her own health care, but also her experience with the practice has significantly time saving okay, fair enough, my time is absolutely more expensive to the system than, say, for example, a digital inclusion coordinator. But actually, maybe that's a role to consider then, you know, having somebody, particularly if you've got challenges with those digital journeys, having somebody whose role is to support patients with their digital journeys, whether it is the NHS app, whether it's about requesting medications, whether it's about photos, whether it's about how to fill in a form, you know, those kind of things. Yeah, I think, I think ability is the one that we can focus on and people are focusing on, which is good. But there still needs to be the provision in terms of the the uh, kit itself, as we talked about. Sorry, Andy, I went on a bit of a rant there, didn't I? No, no, no. All, no, all good stuff. And I probably don't have much more to add at, at practice level other than just to build on what you have said and and uh, say, I think our receptionists and our staff, including the the GP staff, are you know we're sort of a great resource for for helping address these these gaps in digital skills yeah. that people have and kind of taking every kind of small opportunity to skill people up i think is really really useful and i think if we um you know empower our you know reception other teams okay they're, they're stuck for time a lot of the time but often just like with you it's about making their job a bit easier the next time as well you know if that patient mm. can um access this you know the service in a digital way that might actually take some pressure off reception so actually having these conversations with our team about digital literacy and the benefits to the service of people being more digitally literate i think we can maybe motivate empower and make sure that people in our reception other teams you know have the skills to improve digital literacy it it maybe shouldn't be um a problem that's being addressed by the the ivory tower at the ics with their special mm -hmm. program you know maybe we all need to do it because we can all benefit from it so i guess that's what i would add there um i guess the next level you know is pcn level you know what can pcns do about um, digital uh, literacy levels and digital inclusion? I think the answer is a lot. I think this is the level where you start to get a little bit of scale. So this is where, you know, if producing video is, you know, a bit of a big thing for a practice level, maybe this is something you can start to do at PCN level. And then also it becomes much, much, much more credible to do, you know, as you go up and get economies of scale. But that increases your distance from the patient. So it's going to be less kind of have a less local feel and maybe be less impactful um i think you could start to do things around education at pcn level with you know digital inclusion care coordinators social prescribers um i think uh that that's you know they're really powerful roles actually mm -hmm. um and uh, this i i think as a general principle uh, digital inclusion just following the discussion we've had today i really begin to appreciate how actually it can be a powerful tool for addressing uh, those wider determinants as health, as of yeah. health, as well as um, directly uh, people's ability to access healthcare services. And actually, if you were a primary care network, a place, or an ICS, you know, looking for an area to focus on that might improve um, people's health and life outcomes, maybe this is an area to focus, you know, a decent amount of resources on actually, because if your population can access educational opportunities better, job opportunities better, you know, um, housing and other opportunities better, that's going to reduce the impact on on all systems, both now and in the future, you know, not just the health mm. system, but, but the social support systems as well. So, and I think that starts at PCN level and, you know, is something that can be addressed at all levels above that, difficult to do that at the practice level true and i think also important not to forget the system impact so you know obviously we talk a lot about practices and pcns but the system is the thing that sits above that so leaning on you know local services through the councils for example libraries education universities all those kind of other aspects that we talked about that you talked about in, in the wider determinants mm -hmm. of health that actually they are part of that journey just as much as health is because actually if we want people to be healthier we can't just focus on that 10% that they access through us. You know, they can't focus on the 10% quality that they get from us. You know, it has to be the wider system as well, working together to tackle those wider determinants of health, because that's kind of the definition, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But by working collaboratively, actually all of us together, that can be more effective at trying to tackle it. Yeah. 
and I think those sorts of approaches, just kind of skipping up a level or two, really, to you know, place or ICS. I think that's at the level when you can start to think about because of the partners that are involved yeah. in in an ICS with the local council and all those other agencies. You can maybe start to look at um, a more comprehensive approach to digital um, inclusion, and then you can start to look at um, having digital inclusion officers. You know, to find well, why is this person not online? What do they need? Mm -hmm. Is it a device? Is it data access? Is it skills? Is it something else? You know, what can we do uh, to help that person? So I think I'd be looking at that if I was, you know, operating at that kind of level. And maybe this is a lever to pull to help with the inequality agenda as well. Um, just another th thought, obviously, about how you, my mind's running with how you do that. And um, there's a good example in the Kings Fund actually about, I think, 100% leads, it's called, about aiming for 100% um, digital access for the population in leads. Um, but, you know, at that level, you can start to look at, you know, toolkits, you know, uh, that you can then disseminate down, you know, to practices and PCNs, you know, how do you actually do this easily? You know, our staff are following this approach in terms of getting people online. This is how you do it. You know, so I think if you're operating at that that sort of place or ICS level, you can start to really develop some quite sophisticated programs to mm. include digital, uh, improve digital inclusion. Um, any other thoughts at that level? I want to talk about national policy. <laughs> in a Let's second. go to national policy then. Go for it, Andy. <laughs> I'm not sure how much I've got to say, but I think you know, the government must, you know, have a role. They do have a role yeah. in addressing digital exclusion. I think often the government kind of pass these things down to to ICSs, um, but there are things that only the government can do around, um, you know, minimum, maximum pricing of data plans. You know, these social uh, health. Um, uh, information and access tariffs, for example, you know, um, maybe something about, you know, device ownership uh, for, you know, children or other at-risk at groups, um, you know, those sorts of things are, you know, you know do, do we require, um, you know, providers of financial services or other services to do more work? in digital literacy. I know banks do a lot and they must be motivated in some way. So those sorts of things I think are there at national policy. I'm going to stop short of advising at national policy other than asking for more because I think this is a strong lever to pull on inequalities. Any thoughts about national policy, Gandhi? No, just or that, that, policy. Yeah. Well, no, just that, that, you know, like you say, if you want to have bigger impact, that's where you need to go in terms of having a trickle down effect to, to all the other aspects of it and stuff, because then you provide the resources, the tools and, and the information to make that a reality and stuff. I know that in terms of recent stuff that has come out, there has been the Health Watch documents that talks about some of the other changes that may need to be considered in healthcare, as well as the wider elements to tackle inequalities in particular and i guess if egplans want to check out that episode definitely have a look right here because that's probably coming up right here for you um alternately i know that andy's looking at working at some other resources to help people create some of that information to to support people in terms of you know um the creation of information technology and stuff and if that's when and when that's available that'll probably coming up right here as well for you and from that point i think we're going to say we're always going to be here to help tech enhance your primary care and learning definitely catch up with some of the patient support videos and stuff and we will catch you in the next episode.